Welcome to this evening's Beers and Bites episode with our co-host Chris Jordan of Fluency and Jeremy Murdershaw of Fortify 24-7. We do have a very special guest with us tonight, and I mean special guest, uh, Joseph, and we'll introduce him uh, as Joseph Maladzanowski. Uh, he is the uh, Texas Cyber Summit co-founder and Red Team Village co-founder, and I hope I got those right, Joseph. You did. Uh, Great job. And, and what you're going to find is that he's got a real fascinating background. And if you're a DEF CON lover, he, he's right there with you. Right. So there's going to be a lot of history that uh, he can share. And we're excited to really talk to him this evening and explore, explore that background. But with that, first and as always, Chris, why don't you lead us off with what alcohol or <clears throat> I mean beer that you've brought this evening? Well, you know, we always can So I am bringing back one from last week, the Aslan. This is really good stuff, the, the power move. And then um, one that I, I found hidden uh, that my child was trying to hide from me. I got his uh, goose watermelon for dessert. Um, that's a three notch beer. And then I'm gonna wash down a little bit of uh, Irish water, um, some writer's tears in case I need to. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a long day, let's just put it that way. And Jeremy <laughs> was dishing up a storm before this. Jeremy, you must have a keg back there. Well, right. almost almost so I, what i've got if uh you got a couple of different stone beers from stone brewing here in california uh we got the woot stout which is uh 11 and a half percent it's barrel aged bourbon barrels uh it's a stout brew with pecans wheat and rye so that'll be interesting um but i got this big tall boy here this will make the, the the conversation real fun. It's called uh, every every so often Stone comes out with a uh, a special release beer, right? And this is called Enjoy by Four Twenty, uh, Blazy wow. Hazy IPA. <laughs> <laughs> nice nine point nine percent alcohol. So by the time I get to the Woot Stout, I'm you know. Yeah, we, 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 that's why we, we bring a beer master on. We're gonna have to. We're going to have to have a discussion over the hazy techniques that there, that's out there. Very well. Sure. <laughs> and hey, Al, what Alaskan beer did you bring today? Well, I, no, no, no. We're going to go with Joseph first here. Joseph, what did you bring us? Um, so I'm, I'm actually out of the beer that I like. It's a, a Pilsner um, from the Czech Republic. It's uh, pronounced Urkel. It's U-R-Q-U-E-L-L. Um, but I did bring... Um, one of my favorite tequilas, uh, yes, generation is, um, yes. and it's, it's Añejo. Pretty much everything I drink is Añejo aged. Uh, my second favorite is um, this one, Don Julio, 1942. Oh, there wow. you go. Wow. And you can fresh, see the- Fresh out of the freezer. Yeah, you can see the frost on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, heck, I might have to grab, grab my Tito's, but- uh... <laughs> No, actually, what I brought today, guys, was not an Alaskan beer, but you just got to come a little bit further south. We're going to drop you as a sponsor, Al. Uh, to Vancouver, British Columbia, to the Boombox Brewing Company. And we've got a double IPA at 8.1%. Oh, man, I love the can, too. Oh, wow, that's, that's cool. That's nice. That's cool. So, and I have to tell the truth, this, this was IPA beer that my wife bought for when my son visits. And I figured, you know what, let's change it up. She's out to, to Dallas visiting him. So why not? I just grabbed it. <laughs> so Cheers. listen, Cheers. let's, uh, let's jump in and, and, and Joseph, listen, you've had a pretty illustrious career, uh, uh in cybersecurity. And we're really interested to have you talk a little bit about that and, and talk about your involvement in some of these shows and then uh, the creation. Uh, I, it, you know, from reading about you, you've created a lot of different events and stuff over your, your days, right? Right. Uh, so please enlighten us a, a little bit about you, and then we'll go ahead and jump in with some additional questions for you. Um, sure. So, um, wow, where to begin? I'll probably start um, when I was... Uh, probably mid, I don't know, maybe 25% into my career, I worked for an energy company. And um, most of most of my experience there was with routing and switching, networking, doing network design, rolling out, um, you know, do, doing designs and, and building data centers for uh, this refinery company all over the US, all over uh, Canada, 
Mexico and Europe. Um, so I had even, even the Caribbean. So I was, I did a lot of travel. Um, but you know, most people look at that as, oh, wow, you got to go to the Caribbean, but, uh, imagine wearing Nomex, uh, which is a jumpsuit, fireproof jumpsuit and, you know, hard hat and all this other stuff while you're in the Caribbean and it's, you know, 90 degrees. <laughs> yeah. Months, months and months of doing that. So while some of it's fun, the scenery was great to see. I could see the water, you know, 50 feet away from me, but I couldn't touch it. <laughs> and then when you, you know, and when, when you're traveling, you generally like, oh, I'm, I'm just going to work 12, 14 hours. So um, that's what you end up doing. So it was, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed uh, working for the refinery, working for the company. I learned a lot. Um, uh, I, I went to a lot of training, um, went to uh, Black Hat and DEF CON quite a bit, went to all the Cisco Lives for networking stuff and, um, you know, met a lot of really great people with through all of that stuff, all of that, those events. And, uh, you know, then I helped participate in uh, some of the events for Cisco. I got involved in uh, the Cisco IP telephony group called SIPTUG. And um, took over for as a director for events, and I ran events in like 1999 through I think 20 um, 2004 2005. So I did a lot of events there, um, and that was I, that was an eye opener. You know, if you've never run an event, you know, getting a facility, which which I was lucky because the the uh, corporation I worked for, the refiner that I worked for. Um, basically just gave me carte blanche to all of the classrooms. So I was able to do, host like 10 classes all at the same time over two days. And I had about 25 speakers speak um, and provide training. And it was and it was free for everybody that was a member of SIPCUG. So learned a lot with that. Um, also learned how to deal with sponsors and stuff like that as well. So yeah, that was probably back, like I mentioned, in the 1990s, 90, 98, 99. So, um, yeah, that was uh, that was kind of my introduction to the whole, you know, doing events and bringing people together. And I found particular joy in it because people came up to me and said, you know, I really appreciate you putting this on. Um, I, you know, the nearest place I could have gone was to Cisco Live to learn this. Um, I had some security things going on in, in even in 1998, 99. Um, and people came up and said, you know, this security training, I would have had to gone to you know, a specialized class to obtain the the knowledge that I I learned here. So that there, people are appreciative. The speakers were really happy with the event as well. So it, it turned out just to be you know an overall um, win win situation. And it was I just didn't do it in San Antonio. We also ran one in New York, one in D.C., and one in uh, North Carolina um, for those couple of years. So we we wow. basically had um, every year we basically had a a big event going on. I think the biggest one was in San Antonio only because I had the space um, given to me for free and I just pushed it as far as I could <laughs> using it. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was the start of it. Um, I, I spent a lot of time at Black Hat. My com- the company sent me to Black Hat for training. Um, we basically had a choice of what we could do. I would always pick one networking thing and then one security thing every year for training. So I'd um, end up at Black Hat and uh, attended a lot of classes there, le- met a lot of good people, a lot of, you know, national people that you see running around everywhere um, <laughs> in every event. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and then DEF CON, um, I always say I grew up at DEF CON because I started at DEF CON 7, I think it was, and, uh, you know, met a bunch of people. And then the following year, the same people kind of got together again. We ran into each other and and that's how, you know, projects start. You meet people and and you um, have some commonality and you guys form some ideas and then you kind of just run with things and things just kind of grow from there. Um, and what I recommend, and, and I've uh, done this quite a bit, is if you're if you're new to DEF CON or Black Hat, um, specifically DEF CON, if you're new to DEF CON or some other conference that you want to go to, like ShmooCon, volunteer. The best thing to do to get acclimated if you're going and you're like nervous about being around people or crowds or whatever, um, go and sign up and volunteer. And that way you kind of have a mission when you get there, you're going to meet some people that are the organizers or that are in charge of volunteers and you're going to have, and you're going to get to spend some time with them. And then you always have some place to go. Like if you're, 
just an attendee, you may not have some place to go all the time. You may have to hang out in the hallways or whatever. But if you're a volunteer, um, typically there's a volunteer area and you can go hang out with that. So you, so if the crowd gets to be too much um, and you're not used to that, you can always escape back to, to wherever that, that area is at. And Joe, you know, one thing that's it's kind of interesting is I, I look back with nostalgia back to those days, right? I remember before we did the roof over the Lexic, right? When it was still, you could still go inside. It was cool. It was, it was nice. It was small. You could actually see people speak. Um, right. You know, it was, it was kind of interesting, right? You had that, that, the, the, uh, the capture the flag and it wasn't as organized and as, as, as like a major event as it is today. Um, I look back at that and I say to myself, okay, so I'm talking to a guy who, who, learn security the way I did, which was interacting, right? Talking to people on either side of the, of the table and, and learning it. What do you feel about the change in the industry around this formalization of certifications, right? I mean, Mudge will always say, I'll never get my CSSP. I say the same thing. I, <laughs> I, I will retire without a CSSP. I will never take it. Yeah, I'm probably, I'm probably not the right person to ask about a CISSP because um, I found actually particular value in it for me personally. Um, it just so happened that the energy company I was working for was building a brand new data center. Now there's like, I would say 80% of what is in CISSP um, almost can cross over to what you're going to do when you're going to build a new data center, like yeah, so light, it's, it's, light overlays and all of that stuff, cabling, everything. So yeah, for me, the, the side together. So you're saying that you, you you really like the CISSP and the, the structure that has come out of security. Yeah. So I, I had an interesting career with the CISSP and that um, the class I took class. Uh, Sean Harris. I don't know if you remember her. She was one of the original authors of the one of the first books on CISSP. She taught the first class I went to, and uh, it was it was amazing. I got a lot from it. The class was over with. I talked to a couple of the people in the class and I said, hey, you want to do a study group? Um, they joined. I, in the end, I had about 20 people in the study group. And I had Sean Harris come twice and speak to my group at at the energy company where I was running the study group in a small classroom. And um, we would meet every Sunday and we would go through the material. And I, almost everybody in our group uh, passed uh, on their first attempt. So. Wow. Um, but but we we studied hard. We didn't use any of the cheat stuff. We tried to learn the material. We tried to have experts come in and um, teach on a particular subject so that everybody in the group, it would click for everybody. Um, and then when it didn't, we talked about it as a group. Did that If that didn't click with you, then maybe someone else in the group could explain it to you. So CISSP, um, I know you're talking about all certifications. Um, and, no, I'm, I, and I'm kind of guilty of, of having certifications like as, as my milestone for what I'm doing next to my life. Um, I also got a, CI, a CCIE from Cisco in data center networking. I have a, I have this old CNE five, uh, from Novell. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I have a whole bunch, I have a whole bunch of certifications. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I think they have their purpose and I think, um, they're, they should not be the sole determination if someone is fit for a job. Do you um, think I think I think there's people. I think there's people that learn a lot in the field <laughs> that um, will know more about something. Definitely know more something about something than I do. And those okay. people, you you need to judge them on their knowledge rather than on what papers they have. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree yeah. more. So as you look at back on your career and and, and creating these events. Is there anything in particular that stands out in terms of the the need of the broader community, right? You, obviously, you talked about the education, clear need there, right? But, but are you seeing this evolution of need changing year over year as you do these different conferences, i.e., maybe this year I've got to focus really hard on, say, Microsoft because, you know, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, or maybe it's this year... I've got all these Linux vulnerabilities or, you know, any needs in that perspective that you're seeing changing year over year with these uh, conferences? Yeah. Um, and if we put COVID aside for a minute, um, well, we can talk about about that. Um, the target areas for, you know, what's happening in the 
in the world, in the industry, um, that particular year are definitely are important for the conference. But I try to, um, I work, I, I have a board that works um, on like approving speakers and content and training and all that stuff. And we work together to try um, to make sure that, the, that it's a diverse enough um, flow of information that not every class that they're going to go to is going to talk about, you know, the solar winds, you know, supply chain thing. We're not, even this year, we're not going to have 50 talks on supply chain, securing our supply chain. It's important. It's important to have. Um, we'll have a few talks on it, a few experts um, talking about how to shore it up. But it's, the event's not going to be about one particular um, subject. And I really don't think any conference really should be because when you bring in a lot of people, you, um, you're bringing in a lot of different people with a lot of different ideas, a lot of different concepts. They have different experiences. They're looking to get different things out of the conference. Um, that helps formulate what what their experience is going to be, not just with the people, but also with the training that that you're you're bringing in. So having a diverse amount of uh, or diverse type of education coming in uh, between the different classes, even the levels. For example, um, we do a one on one track, and um, some conferences don't do that because they they're a afraid of people saying, oh, I don't want to be in a one-on-one class. Our one-on-one classes are, end up getting so packed, we have to run them two or three times. I don't know if you remember in, in 2019, we had to run a class four times because we could not fit enough people in the class. And thankfully, the, the, the speaker, the trainer, uh, was gracious enough to do it that many times. It was, it was, awesome. it was amazing. So we, we tried it. So Beyond our schedule, we try to adapt like that as well. So if we see this huge demand and and people are asking for it, we will figure out a way to make it happen with them. So, and I think a lot of conferences do that. Um, I, I don't know a whole lot of conferences that don't that do that have their own tracks. That I guess if you're selling a product and it's your conference, you can do whatever you want to with it and just talk about your product. But um, it, at this at the events I run, I try to make things. Um, as broad as possible to bring in uh, to bring in experiences for everybody from the novice all the way up to the you know the ninja expert. Yeah, but it's not that obvious. I mean, if you take a look at like Black Hat, the evolution of Black Hat, right? It's it got to a point where you got the same speakers over and over again, and they show up at DEF CON, right? And so all of a sudden you got B sides. Probably the greatest thing that ever happened to the the security conferences was B sides. Look at Saha and all the 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 creation around having an open mic night That's right that want to get off their chest but they're working on it and i have to tell you as a guy that's i've been to 20 plus def cons and and i i have to say that i enjoy the speed speeches that that dt has added i've i love b-sides no matter how politically incorrect some of this crap that shows up on b-sides is it's <laughs> wonderful right and you brought up the diversity I don't know the open mic concept where you can just have people go up and, 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 and throw a uh, rejected like B sides was, I, I'm not going to reject the single person, right? The B sides really did change. I think had a greater impact than anybody expected, right? Where B sides, like people I knew would say, listen, I'm going to go to B sides during black hat. I'm going to go to B sides. I'm not going to go to another, you know, infomercial again. I mean, so you know. so you're involved with Saha, you're involved with Texas or Cyber. I mean, how do you, so you're on both sides, right? One, you have to have this formal, the other one, you're the, the Saha. Yeah. How's that going for you? And, and, and do you find a tremendous amount of creativity still there when, when you hear? So um, I'm one of those people that still go to Black Hat. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> um, my my feeling is really that uh, that there's value in all of these conferences. You have to you have to be aware of what the value is. You and what your goals are. What what you want to get out of the event. What you want to uh, what you put into the event is what you're going to get out of it. Everybody says, and and that's true because um, I'll take classes um, at Black Hat. Still, my I'll the company I work for now will ask me what I want to do. And I basically still do the same thing, Cisco Live and Black Hat. Yeah. So um, I like to take the learn classes from or take classes from the experts as well. Sometimes I'll even do like refresh stuff. Like like if I, if I know like BGP, I may want to sit in a BGP class or if I 
um, no particular writing exploits, I may sit in a writing exploits class again. And, and that's because I want to pick up whatever the new techniques are that I may yeah. not have learned on my own. So now if you're talking about like, like Black Hat, um, DEF CON and B-Sides, they all have their place. And they have their place for people that, that work for corporations and can, the corporation can afford to send them there. Um, they have their place for the people, the people that are novice and in, in working in a job at McDonald's or wherever, and they can't afford that class, but they can go to B-Sides because it's way cheaper. And they're gonna get some quality, they're gonna get quality education that's going to help them in their career that will maybe move them out of the job that they're in into a cybersecurity job that then maybe that company sends them to the, the more formal, yeah, bigger, I guess one of the things more I think bigger classes. Off, yeah, Joe, is, is that if you take a thing, look at like the Wild West Hack and Fest, right? With Black Hill Security, that's a great group of guys. Right. And, uh, yeah, I they're all they're super knowledgeable guys. people. Right. And they just, they, they did, they, they're now expanding. I think one was in San Diego, but now the next one's going to be in Nevada. I'm going to try to get Jeremy to go, go, go with me on that one. It's not a date, Jeremy. You're, you're going to be <laughs> to the, the conference. No, and, I'll go uh, to South Dakota. I just got to give me a Harley before I go. But they're, they're, they, they, they moved it up because last time I went there was, I was going to swear, freezing. <laughs> it was going to that F word in front of it. It was cold. Um, but it is, it is a, you know, it's empty by the time they did the Wild West. But now I think they're moving it up and then they put this one in Nevada. But, but I guess what I'm saying is because, you know, I was just exposed to Cyber Texas. And that's another one that, that deserves a little bit of recognition. It's, it, you know, these, the ability of getting uh, decent speakers is, is getting easier and easier for these smaller venues or in these different venues, right? There's spread but, out. Yeah, certain certain yeah. speaker. Yeah, certain speakers are that way. Um, there's a lot of speakers that won't do smaller events. They won't do B sides. They won't do Texas Cyber Summit. They won't do they they won't do some like maybe even the Wild West Hacking Fest. Um, and they only look to do like the big name shows. There's speakers that are that way. Um, yeah. The the and at Texas Cyber Summit, the way that we've been able to get other speakers that are you know have big names is through personal relationships. You know, whether that's my relationship or somebody else on the team's relationship, ask them, hey, would you like to speak? But- You can ask Jeremy right now. He's right there. <laughs> Absolutely. I yeah. accept. So, awesome. So speaking of that, let's, let's get a quick plug in here because I think the audience, it's even worth traveling in from out of state uh, because as I understand, San Antonio is one of the biggest cybersecurity markets out there. It is. It is definitely. We have, so there's agencies that I can't mention that are here, but there's some that I can. Um, there's, the, there's the NSA moved some of their stuff out. Yeah. There. Yeah. Maybe. And the AFWIC, which. <laughs> yeah. Some of us, some of us know about this with the Air Force base there and stuff, right? Yeah. I, I, I worked in, I worked in federal for 10 years. So. <laughs> yeah, they also moved I have to be careful Canada. about what I say. Yeah. <laughs> San Antonio to Salt Lake because they couldn't get enough people. And the Mormons, they get their clearances like this. So, anyways. yeah, yeah, their life is boring. <laughs> but you've got you've got an event that's coming up because Texas is open for business now. Right? It is uh, limited yes. attendance, but at the end of October. So, talk a little bit about that that date for the the audience. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. So, the Texas Cyber Summit is in its fourth year. Um, this year, we're going to do four uh, tracks, two really large tracks and two smaller tracks. And then we're also gonna have villages. Um, we'll have a giant room for some villages. And then we'll have a, a couple other smaller specialized spaces. We can support up to 2000 people and and that's even with social distance. So yeah. You heard that Jeremy, Joseph, he's, Joseph's saying that uh, once again, Black Hat, or sorry, DEF CON is canceled. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Texas it is. San yeah, so, so the event is gonna have, um, like I mentioned, four tracks. Um, but but beyond just the on-site part of it, we also have a virtual component of it. And last year, our virtual component, we had like 10,000 on our Red Team Village site. We had like um, almost 4,000 on our um, on our Gray Hat site, and uh, around 3,000 on our TCS site. So we had we had like thousands of people attending last year for all of our events from all over the world. So we're expecting. A pretty large number this year as well. Um, we have some amazing keynotes already lined up. Um, I don't know if you 
had had a chance to look at our um, book uh, at our uh, website um, as far as so we have keynotes both virtual and live and then we have um, briefings virtual and live and then we have workshops virtual and live so we're filling all all of those schedules in right now it's it's a massive undertaking but we're trying to make sure that that we bring the the same value that we're going to bring in person to the people that are attending virtual as well um, and and the and most of the content uh, that's going to be virtual is going to be free and open to to everybody uh, there's I think it requires a donation. The other thing to mention is Texas Cyber Summit is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, so any anybody that donates money to it or sponsors or buys a ticket or whatever, it's all tax deductible. So, um. <laughs> so, so one would ask, you know, you have a keynote uh, senator. Is that last year or this coming year? The senator that's listed there? Yeah. Um, he's this year. What, what, so it, that's interesting. So. Uh, politics in the in the cybersecurity world. How, yeah, how, I've always tried. I've always play out? yeah, no, it it doesn't play out. So I have a conversation with. Uh, last year we had a um, a, a state uh, representative come, and he happened to be a Republican. And I had a talk mm-hmm. with him, and I said, "Whatever you talk about, it needs to stay neutral. You cannot talk about you know I hate." Democrats or I hate other Republicans <laughs> or whatever. I, I don't know. Politicians are politicians, right? So um, we had him on a panel. Um, th- it worked out fabulous. Um, I had a conversation with this senator as well about the same thing. Um, really, I think everybody really wants to know what's going on with the laws and um, you know what's happening in cyber as far as what the government's doing to protect the average everyday citizen and bringing, th- bringing in these politicians is a good way uh, to get some of that information to the attendees. So I wouldn't have them, I wouldn't have them just like for any other reason, but I, I do bring them in so that they can convey some, some critical component to the attendees that they need to know about cybersecurity. So Senator Menendez is part of some sort of working group within the, or, within the government focused on cyber or what's his role? Yeah, he is and and healthcare. So I wanted to, so he's going to talk a little bit about COVID and the cybersecurity uh, aspects Mm -hmm. around COVID and stuff like that. So yeah, protections and all that. Yeah. I don't think people really appreciate as much as we've tried to educate our, our, our growing audience of, of listeners, uh, you know, COVID represented a change in not only uh, the healthcare delivery model, but also in, in how hackers used real-time events happening in the world to exploit. Uh, that, was a, that was an early episode of ours, wasn't it? It was like episode six or seven. Well, we had, yeah, Ohad, no, was, we had Ohad on from the CTI League, but I think we right. talked about you know how COVID has been impacting and how the hackers are exploiting COVID. Sure, sure. Yeah. And, and you have to remember that, that the more, um, per, uh, I, I would say, persistent attackers, I don't call them hackers, the more persistent attackers are part of organized crime. And organized crime operates like a business. They look at the headlines. They use every part of the headline to take advantage of your grandma, your grandpa, your aunts and uncles. Mm-hmm. And, you know, <laughs> and they use they use uh, tragedy, strategy, eh, tragedy, like, Drinks, that's, that's a shot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, 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 actually, <laughs> that's how we handle it here. You can't have water since you, you, you're drinking water out of that cup. You a bunch no, of I'm people. not. It has tequila in it. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> you got to do a shot. You haven't been drinking at all, and I'm already at my second beer. Uh oh. And that's right. the nine percenter. <laughs> actually, I, I need to step away for a moment. Can we have Emily pause? Pause. Yeah, I need to. Yeah. Return beer. I need to. I don't have a bottle opener, right? This is like. <laughs> well, that's okay. Yeah. So that's. Go, go back. I'll be right back. Okay. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah. when my wife is here, I just text her. She's my beer caddy. She'll bring stuff to me and whatever. <laughs> well, that's convenient. Yeah, but but now I'm a bachelor for a few days. She's up watching the grandkids. Yeah, I'm teaching a class. I'm teaching a class next week, two days, and we're supposed to go to the beach. And I'm like, well, I'm teaching a class. I'm I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> right. 
So just to confirm, Joseph, uh, Fluency is a, is one of the selected sponsors to be there this year? Yes, sir. Oh. Yeah, you're you have the you're you have the second choice in table location. So that's how we do it. It's it's on order of who sponsors first. You put, is put what next to the lodge. You that are cheetahs. <laughs> to the bar? <laughs> you want to be next to the bar? Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah, we'll no, that one. What, what we need to do is have a have a, uh, one of We're the booth tapes, right? A, a local brewery come in and, and co-sponsor with us. Oh, actually, you know what? Yeah, that would be awesome. You know, the hotel is totally open to that for me. Really? Okay. Yeah, I had I had left something in from um, the Hyatt when we were at the Hyatt last, two years ago about craft soda, right? And popcorn or something, and they said, yeah, you can bring in whatever you whatever like whatever beverage you want so, so jeremy maybe maybe you can you know they caught this whole piece out but we'll use it as evidence we can feel this joseph that uh we can have a table because we were talking about having a table at defcon where we and uh just podcast we yes. can do, do it at the texas cyber and we can heckle well, i'm gonna have a whole i'm gonna have a whole media corner so you guys can have a media spot as well you don't have to do it at your table sweet okay and, sweet. and we can heckle the speakers <laughs> well, that sounds fun. I don't know All about right. that. <laughs> All right. So, can, can, um, Emily, can we, so can we bring tomatoes? <laughs> Emily, take three. All right. So, so with that, Jeremy, where were you on the questions before you no, had no, to go no, get Jeremy's going to explain why he left and we had to pause. He's got, oh, yeah. Got so, the reason why I had to step away was because this lovely beer had a cap on it that I couldn't pull off with my teeth. <laughs> so, that's rough. <laughs> <laughs> so, that so just we, made my teeth hurt. <laughs> yes, thank you. So we were talking about the Texas Cyber Summit, right? We're talking about the senator being senator there. Senator Menendez. Jeremy. Right. So I think the, uh, the next logical question is, um, in your experience running these conferences, the, putting on these shows, what is the craziest, top two crazy things you've ever seen? And what are the, the two worst things you've ever seen? Oh, man. I can start with the worst things I've seen. <laughs> so um, not, in my, not at, not at uh, Texas Cyber Summit, but this had to have been like at DEF CON maybe eight or nine years ago when they did the DNS hijacking and they hijacked everybody to some like horrible, horrible porn. It was like the worst. I, it was so gross. I don't even remember what it was. I just remember being grossed out about it. And that was the, that whole, what they did was actually what made me think of um, starting another contest, like messing with traffic and sending things out so people would see who's paying attention to, to network traffic. Yeah. So that was, that, that, well, that was like super gross. It actually spur, spurred an idea for me. So. <laughs> it was like DEF CON seven or eight or maybe nine when you had the wall of sheep and you intercepted pictures. And someone started putting. Oh, that was Driftnet. Yeah, we were using it. It was really a free pro. And, 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 and I can't describe this type of porn on the walls. And people yeah. started going, oh, that's a great idea. And they started shooting more and more porn on the wall. Anyways. It, well, we were, yeah, no, what happened, I think it was maybe like DEF CON 12 or 13. I think we were at the Riviera. We had a separate screen and we we're like, where are we going to put it on there? I don't know. Let's put Driftnet. So we put Driftnet on there. And then people started seeing their, their crappy images up here and then like right away like in five minutes jeff came by and said you need to take that down so we're like oh, sorry. <laughs> we're like oops right. sorry about that so that, that was one item joseph what was the okay, second one item? Now. wow <laughs> second second weird thing i man i, I don't know i mean this like uh, how about the everything wifi? almost becomes normal now so what, what, i remember being at black hat one year maybe he was also at um Defcon for a couple of years. The guy with who had like fifteen Wi-Fi pineapples. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Cactus. That guy. Yeah, yeah. He still he still runs around. Yeah, he still runs around. Yeah. yeah, that was a pretty interesting project. Um, yeah, he actually comes to Texas Cyber Summit. So oh, that's very cool. Yeah, I can't remember the name his name, but yeah, we we met, we hung out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. cool guy. Hey, um, wi talk about Wi-Fi cactus guy. If you watch this, listen to this, reach out because we we want to talk to you. Yeah, you guys should because he has he did some he did some other interesting stuff um, yes, he did. around DEF CON. Um, maybe 
two years ago, three years ago, he did some cool stuff where he put little beacons out and stuff and was collecting data from all over the place. So yeah, it would be good to talk to him about that kind of stuff. So we got hack yeah. five right down the corner around here. So the yeah. creators. I think I got hack five all over my house. Yeah. My kids, I, I, my, I, my kids are afraid of me. It's great. I <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't even reach. I, I mean, anywhere I reach, I'm hitting a hack five device. <laughs> so as you as you look at today's environment, I mean, I, I think from a company perspective, we're starting to hear more and more, and, and I almost think it's exponential, right? The not only the breaches, but but the loss of data, right, and, and, and stuff of that nature. And, and and I was just reading one that today about where the supplier to Apple, right? They had a breach and now all of their blueprints for their future products and stuff is threatened to be put on the web unless you pay like $50 million ransom. Right. Uh, are you seeing, experiencing this too in, in your environments with- Oh yeah, experience? yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's Great. become- it's, <laughs> What was that, Chris? New version of ransomware. <laughs> yeah, it's become a, it's become a um, an easier way to um, hack people is through ransomware than it used to be, where they would have to like go into your computer and steal your credit cards and and your e other email accounts and sell all this stuff. Um, ransomware, you know, you um, there's some hands off going on with that. I mean, you can still trace the Bitcoin, but um, you can trace it around enough until it hits a mixer or something. But yeah, like what still, about how do you feel about tracing Bitcoin? How easy is that? I mean, I don't think that one's as easy as everybody keeps on saying it is. It, it's pretty easy until you hit a mixer and they're doing thousands yeah. of transactions that are very small. <laughs> that you can't you can't really tell what what was what. I, I think I think someone with a big data system could eventually start coming up with some patterns and start tracing some people, uh, some of these attacks back to some of these mixers that are then filtering the money to other people, but. Yeah, um, like you mentioned, the the attacks that are coming out, the um, privacy uh, that's being lost by these companies, and the and the IP intellectual property that's being lost by them, um, it it is increasing exponentially. It seems like um, I don't I haven't seen the numbers from the last couple of years, but you have to remember last year became a unique year when a lot of people had to stay home. I think that fueled a lot of fire for. Um, these attackers to be able to spend more focused time developing better skills, um, homing them, like doing a bunch of trial and error attacks against other smaller organizations till yeah, they got you, them right. You just were talking about an article just recently in our company that the last year equaled the previous 15 years as far as economic damage from breach. Sure. Yeah, it's, I, and, it's, and it's actually become more profitable and, and less risky for these cartels and these uh, and these things and, and these stuff, podcasters, to, and these podcasters, these podcasters Chris, <laughs> to do ransomware to pay for their podcast hosting fees, <laughs> right? Damn right. In, in, in fact, it's, there was a an instance that happened, an issue that happened here in in our area, here in Los Angeles area, right, where um, a kid went on to the, to one of the darknet forums. Uh, did a DDoS, paid for a DDoS attack against his school so he could get out of going to school. Cool, cool, cool. I, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it one bit. Al, do you remember that conversation? <laughs> we actually talked to a person in the school, school district, and that's their number one concern is DDoS to the school because kids use it to get out of. This was before COVID. They were using yeah. it to get out of, uh, out of, out of tests. Out of tests, yeah. That, that, that's yeah. great. I wish I had this when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so and that, that that is a problem, definitely. Um, denial of service attacks are on the increase, and I mean, we saw it, we saw it back when I was a kid too, right? I mean, you would like For mess video. around with some game that you're trying to, you know, get into. You'd figure out a way to like hammer the server until you could get to where you wanted to get to, you know, freeze it or whatever. So. With a you know just That's inundating true. it with traffic, but there's a lot of protections now. So you know companies and schools and stuff that aren't using DDoS protection really need to get on board with it because it is a big threat. If they can't deliver education to to the students that are now all learning from home, I guess um, you know then then what value is that school really? I mean, you're, 
we're paying a lot of money to those schools to educate our, our kids. I don't have any kids in school right now, but I'm still paying money for it. I would like to see that some kids are being educated, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I know, I know in fact that uh, my son-in-law's father is like a superintendent of a school district up in the Dallas area, but uh, they, they said that they absolutely were prepared ahead of time. Unlike the majority of schools, for a remote education module. And I think kind of the same thing applies these companies so that when COVID hit and all of a sudden everybody was locked down at home, that whole corporate uh, network perimeter just kind of like melted away overnight. And that's where we see a lot of exposure come in, right? Yeah, and, and, you're, and you're right about that because now you have people working from home that would have been on site and may have done some upgrades to some firewalls or VPN devices or some other remote access control systems. And now those things are getting put on the shelf because the they need to be there in person and maybe their company won't let them go there or some, something like that. So yeah, the uh, co companies really need to start paying attention to their parameter, even though um, their workforce is at home now. Um, and they need to pay attention to their endpoints, right? Because now that's, it's always been the number one attack vector endpoints, um, but it's now even more important. Endpoints. Endpoints are email, email, and the computer. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. The two you know, most, so I, I know, I know a guy. Things. I know a guy that can get in that can get into anybody's computer that he targets, um, and he just uses email. He just figures out a way to craft an email that you're going to open. And he graduates high school next week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, junior high. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some of yeah, those are good. Going, Jeremy, uh, screw that. How's the beer going on it? You can get that, that specialized one. Uh, it's your limited edition. Go, how's it going? Well, you know what? I'm not this feeling. Good. Can Are you I'm, feeling it? I'm not feeling blazy yet, so it's probably <laughs> not. It's not uh, brewed with any kind of marijuana hop, but uh, it's really, my, it's really good, actually. I had my cork get stuck, so I I used my razor knife to cut it out while we were talking. There you go. <laughs> and, and of course, Joseph just got his tequila shots going, so he's he's good to go. Thank you. <laughs> There we go. No, we, we do that, Joseph. You know, this is your first time speaking on our podcast, and like DefCon, you have to you have to do the shot. Yeah, you have, have to, to do a little okay. liquored up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so there we go. While you're drinking, here's a question for you. Uh, uh, the, 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 the largest uh, <laughs> mining, the largest coin uh, outside of Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining. Monero, Monero is the most prevalently mined coin because it's in all the crypto miners, 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 can you, this applications, you, yeah. let, let me, let me try that again. It's in all the <laughs> crypto miners that are deployed through these uh, malwares and backdoors. And oh, you're talking like the crypto miner software that, that, that yeah. people uh, get infected with. Yes. Right. So I, I saw, but, but you understand uh, why, you know, why that your, works probably. on your, you're going to have a Monero. No, Jeremy, it's, you, it's, you froze. You froze. You froze up, buddy. Go on, try it again. I, you, were I, talking, I, you were talking about the Molino brothers, <laughs> what, you, the singers from Mexico. Yeah. Yes, the Burrito Brothers. Yes. <laughs> hey, I don't know. I don't know those guys, and even though they visit me, I still don't know them. <laughs> I know nothing. No. Right? I, <laughs> the the Monero cryptocurrency mining is a sure. prevalent miner that gets deployed throughout people's networks through malware. I noticed that you had a Monero um, village village. And I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, Monero, the theory behind Monero is it's a Russian mafia SVR funding source. So hey, they need money too. Monero village. It's like they need money too. Come on, man. I, I, I thought the, the, the thing around that particular <laughs> cryptocurrency was that it required uh, using the main CPU processor versus the CPU processor for the algorithm of the one-way hash. And so it makes sense that that particular type of crypto is used in miners because you're leveraging the CPU versus the GPU, right? And It'll it, do it, both. Yeah, yeah apparently it can use both, yeah. So it, it, back, it, back, to the, back to the village... Yeah, back to the village. We invited all of the villages that were at DEF CON to be part of Texas Cyber Summit, part of Grey Hat that we did last year. Um, and any villi and really our call for villages is open. So if you want to do a village, um, submit a paper and we'll be happy to 
look at it and see if we can add it to our agenda. Monero, um, we work with them. Village or, or t- Cyber Summit? T- yeah, Texas, Texas Cyber Summit, where okay. we have villages. We called them havens when we first opened because we didn't want to. Oh, yeah, the with, Trump yeah. closed the havens down. <laughs> we didn't want to, confl- <laughs> yeah, we didn't want to conflict with, um, with DEF CON, but uh, then everybody started using villages. So I was like, there's no sense in us using something different if the standard term is going to be villages. So. Right. So, yeah, so um, that guy, um, I think he's from the Netherlands that runs that. Um, he's a pretty cool guy. Um, I, I have no idea about the connection to SVR or Russia or any of that stuff. Um, but I do. I will have some, probably have some Russian speakers. I have some speakers from China. Um, I don't, um, when it comes to, like, um, race, nationality, whatever, I have, I, 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 I'm like colorblind or whatever you want to call it. I believe all of us can learn something from everybody. So um, yeah. if there, if there's a guy from Russia and he's an expert in, um, you know, exploiting something, some IOT device or whatever, um, and he wants to speak, I definitely want to host him and have him spread that knowledge because we can't defend against it. If, if we're not letting that guy speak about it. Right. Yeah, that's true. So, so I think we need to get a village that says, all right, how many beers can Jeremy drink before he starts slurring? <laughs> right. A beer. Oh, actually, beer village. <laughs> beer village. Special. Yes, I, I bet mean, you. I, I bet you, if we did a beer village, not only would we have, it would be the most popular village. No, there isn't. We, I think there is a. But we could get that sponsored. There's asked me the hoppy, the hoppy, <laughs> hoppy village. <laughs> but, but yeah, we could do the hoppy. That's you know what, excellent. That's a great concept right there, right there alone. You just made tonight. Yeah, absolutely. So you were going to say, Jeremy, before? I'm just... Right. Uh, just San Antonio has UFO, right? You got a bunch of UFOs down there, don't you? I, I have no idea. I've never seen one. Oh, you, you guys, that's a drinking place down there. So you're not drinking? Oh, the yeah, UFO. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we do over on... Um, yeah, on, yeah, I know where you're talking about. Never mind. It's known for the collection of beers. <laughs> yeah, I actually have a card from that UFO place. I thought you meant the real UFOs. No, 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 that's down they're, in Vegas again. Yeah. They're, they're like in the news. They've been in the news like almost every oh week God. now. Serious shit. Well, no, that's out. That's, that's out in California, off the coast. With no, the no, 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 no. It's, it's next to it's, it's carriers. Yeah, it's 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 aircraft who are doing their their normal traffic patterns are seeing these things and actually triangles. The, the U.S. The, 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 finally, the, 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 the acorns and the blimps. The yeah. U.S. Department of Justice or whoever, some some government agency came out and said, "Yes, those are not of the, our planet." Yeah, yeah, they're, 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 un- they're just saying they're unidentified craft. That's all they're saying. Right. I, but they were, I saw pictures of them in their triangles, and it's like, how in the heck? The pyramid one, yeah. That, that one's yeah. scary as crap. That one's excellent. yeah. Well, the guy took it from he got his iPhone out and his F fourteen Tomcat. It's like, oh shit, look at that. Beep. Yeah. What about the they, when they, when they do the uh, they lock onto it that object and lock onto it. That's crazy as hell. Oh, right. follow it all over the place. Yeah. So we'll all right. UFOs, <laughs> another another day. Right. Right. Wrong podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so so in terms of the other villages that you have going on, Joseph. Um, so we, you've got the one on the crypto mining. Uh, what other ones do you have? <laughs> um, I, I, I'd have to go look at the website. We're, but like I said, we still have them open. I know Blue Team Village talked about being there. ICS Village and IoT Village have both confirmed. So I know we're going to at least have them. Um, we have enough space for like six villages. So we still have okay. a few, a little bit of room left. Um, if uh, If there's any villages out there that are, interested in uh, being in texas um in october when it's warm come on come when on it's warm, that's a fact and, and listen for our constituents listening uh, all three of you you don't know, think about about the uh, potentially doing a village here right yeah and we're doing a talk yeah and while we have your attention there somewhere over here is a like button somewhere over here is a subscribe button Hit them when you get a I never put those on our videos. I don't think <laughs> on this video you definitely need to do it. <laughs> well, well, listen, Joseph. In, in terms of as, as we start to wind down here, for our audience, in all seriousness, uh, again, given started, your experience, man. given your experience, you know, with with the red red team village and and, and uh, all the other things in your background, what advice, top two advice, would you give to 
businesses today, and I'm, I mean from small to large, that, that they should focus on in 2021? Wow, that's pretty. That's gonna that's gonna be pretty deep because um, well, the first thing I would say is you can't hire um, your experts your way out of a problem, um, and you can't. Af- there's there's experts that you can't afford to keep on staff, not because you can't pay them enough, because those experts are not going to be um, challenged enough, and they're going to leave. Yep. Um, so if you so outsourcing used to be a bad word to me. Um, it's not anymore. If you need to outsource because you don't have the specialty in house, um, and there's a company that has those experts, I would say, consider doing the outsourcing just maybe on that particular component of, of whatever is a challenge for your organization. Um, and then the second thing is to educate the hell out of your employees, your employees. Again, the, the endpoint is the weakest link. Your employees, I hate to say are the weakest link, but your employees are one of those links in your company that that need to be educated so that they can spot these spot issues early on. And if I may add a caveat to that, it, it's been our experience that when you use the term employee, most times the executive staff of companies <laughs> are saying, that's not me. Right. But, but guess who's yeah. getting breached the most with these yeah. spear phishing attacks? And they've got the highest level credentials that then... Uh- Go laterally, right? Yeah, the whale, whale fishing, spear fishing. Um, yeah, those are those are the worst ones. And really, even the board of directors of corporations and you know all the executive staff, all of them really need to be educated. They, they're all going to say that they don't have time because there's too many things going on. They have to have time because the, it's becoming a serious threat. If if you don't put attention to um, to these type of risks. You're 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 creating the risk. You're creating a bigger risk by not uh, placing any attention on the on the potential threat, because like you said, if they're spear fishing or whale fishing, and they catch the CEO or CFO of a corporation, um, they may not just stop there. They may be able to root all their way into your organization, into the organization itself, and and really exploit everybody in the organization, um, and not just like maybe backdoor a program that you know. Uh, thousands of people are downloading and using, but actually like get into, get into deeper stuff. Um, and you, and even use, um, connections that you may have with, uh, partners, you know, back where you're, where you're connected to a partner, they may even traverse that connection and exploit your partners. And now you're suddenly at risk, not just for your own corporation, but because you've, you've, uh, opened yourself up to another corporation getting, and, and I would add involved. liability to that, of course. Right. Right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just today we had a uh, uh, an incident. We were doing an IR for <clears throat> customer has all of the proper stuff, right? They do security awareness training. They do. They've got a security email, security email gateway. They've got uh, endpoint security. Okay. They've got a SIM. They've got a SOC team that's looking at stuff, right? But somehow, somebody still impersonated the CEO. It got through because they cracked his password. Um, They then sent a series, they sent out an email to everybody in the address book, which was not only the internal people, but, you know, his external people that he was emailing. His external contacts, yeah. It was a a legit URL, right? uh, Thinkific.com, which is like a learning management system. Uh, Legitimate learning, it's not some BS thing, fly by night, you know, uh, something just put in woo, you know, in, in a WordPress site temporarily. Um, then they had a, uh, an intermediate uh, duck DNS server fake hosting a fake OL 365 login prompt. It was pretty sophisticated. Yeah. Was, um, Jeremy, you did a great job, Jeremy. Uh, thank you. That was my, my, actually my son did that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's how I paid for my hat. <laughs> anyway, but, but like you can you can still have all of the security in the world, and, and and these things will still get through, right? So it's not just awareness training is an important thing for your organization, but really every organization. Right. Fortunately, some of the the people that are in his address book uh, knew enough to go. Wait a minute, this doesn't seem right. 
Let me. Why would this person be sending me this? Yeah. This particular type of thing. So let me send him a, I'm going to create a, compose a new message and send a new message to the, the person and say, did you intend to send me this or is this hanky? And, and fortunately they were able to, to prevent anything from happening. But one of the customers of the company clicked on the button, got a worm, delivered ransomware through Emotet into the environment. Yeah, imagine what imagine what that does to the reputation of the organization that sent that email out. Yeah, but it's horrible. And it's not even that the organization did it. Did right. It, they didn't do it. It was proven that we, we proved that it didn't actually right. come from them, but it, it yeah, came but from it, them. It's right? perception, right? Perception is reality in this market. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's unfortunate. The, and, and I think, you know, the point there, Jeremy, I, I take away here is that it, it, you always go ahead and trust, but verify. Always sure. verify. You have, you have that best verification. Best thing like that. And, and we, I've heard story after story where, where someone, maybe it's procurement, said, this doesn't make sense. You know, we've never sent a check to these people before or, uh, you know, other things like that where someone has stood up and said, hey, what is this? And it's that level of questioning that I think needs to be added to that training, Joseph, other than this is what a spear phishing attack looks like. How well, they right. The problem is you don't, need, you don't know what a spear phishing attack looks like. It right. Literally Most be people anything. don't. It could be yeah. anything. There are organizations being spawned by these APT groups that are IT services companies delivering, providing services. So they're making revenue legitimately, right? They're funneling back to DPRK or whoever. And then um, they're getting the technology so they can reverse engineering it. Right. And, and and they're 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 taking headlines, they're taking everything, and they're just they're crafting intelligent emails. There's the obvious email where people can't spell, words are out of order. Right, and right. Are, that never those, the, those, the, the, those, the, yeah. had ninety eight percent non effective rate. Right. It, yeah. it's, like, it's like getting an email from Chris. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. And you're like, well, I'm going to go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and block this or ignore it or delete it, right? But then you get the legitimate looking email or you have correspondence with something or somebody that's legitimate or feels legitimate. And then all of a sudden they send you a, a DocuSign or a Dropbox link or something and you click on it and then grants. I've had someone send me yeah. documents lately. So someone is obviously at a compromised LinkedIn account. Mm -hmm. and, they, and it's a it's a prime account so they can send documents or send emails to people they don't know i got i got hit twice by people wanting me to open a damn document through linkedin that's crazy yeah i, t I tell everybody send me everything in a text file <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure so, so with know, that guys, to drop tables go ahead we're at the minute. top of the you're, hour you're now so to... get your final questions going he's trying to stop you know, you did. First of all, you didn't tell us about. You told us about some low lights. Tell us about your highlights. Oh yeah, My highlights. Where are the, where are the yeah, top yeah, two highlights? Yeah. Oh, um, I re I remember one year. I remember one year at DefCon, we were um, working at the wall, and um, we had um, well, there's two times. So one time, um, Twitter had just taken off. That tells you how old I am. <laughs> and <laughs> Twitterific was like the new client out, and all their traffic was in plain text, and we were. We we're getting so many plain text passwords and those passwords, some people, I don't know who they were, tested them against the people's email and they were the same password. But anyway, so we we're posting so many um, of these user IDs and passwords, it, 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 it became, it was impossible for us to do anything else. It was like, we, we can't, I mean, it's thousands and thousands of them. So um, a guy on our team called somebody at Twitter and said, hey, you, you you guys need to know what's going on and this is serious. Can you turn HTTPS on or, or SSL or something? And they were like, Oh yeah, we were planning on turning it on next week. And we were like, you should turn it on right now. <laughs> and they said, well, we don't, we didn't know what was going to happen. So uh, we were afraid it might crash the server or whatever, but they ended up turning it on. And then they, um, they turned it on a couple servers, turned on a couple more. And eventually I think by Saturday, Saturday morning, they had all of them up and all their traffic was encrypted. So um, from that perspective, you know, when you're helping um, 
um, secure uh, an industry, you know, helping people um, secure applications and helping them protect themselves, uh, you, you get a good feeling from that. Um, another time we captured some stuff and this guy had CEO of a company sent a file, having to send a file to an uh, IT guy internally and I captured it and I was like looking, I'm like, holy crap, this is like every password for every uh, Linux server on their entire network and all their exposed servers as well. And I was like, shit, I can't, I'm, I'm not posting any of this shit. So I held on to it and I just said, I'm going to post the um, user and the password. And that was it, nothing else. And the guy came over and he was like pissed off at me. And he was like, um, you guys intercepted my um, cell phone traffic. I'm like, I, don't, I have it right here if you want to look at it. <laughs> and he looked at it and he like, he was like, holy shit, my cell phone went browse uh, automatically attached to the to the DEF CON network and I sent this traffic over it. Um, but uh, yeah, and we, we worked with them to like make sure that, uh, but, but we were not the biggest threat, right? There's thousands of other people um, that are attackers that are sitting there looking for that type of stuff as well. And mm -hmm. so, you know, oh, yeah. if you assume that, that I got it, you have to assume that at Everybody least a thousand other it. people got it, right? 100%. So, so my conversation, I was a smart ass to begin with. I said, well, we have this thing. You have to go through our education program before we take you down from the wall. And, <laughs> and he's just turning redder and redder. And I was like, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we just had a chat about it. And, and uh, I, I told him, we're not the threat. You really need to think now about what, ha what happened and, and like, you know, go off net and go talk to your team and make sure that they start changing stuff. because. You know, there's people out there that are going to uh, take advantage of it. But I mean, I, I almost every year I could come every year we had something weird like that happen. Like the year that DEF CON and Black, the, the year Black Hat did RFID on their badges, um, we had a, we put up a poster that had this giant RFID uh, reader on the back of it. If you walked up to it, basically read everything that was on you. And, <laughs> and some, some law enforcement from, that was attending black hat came over and stood in front of the sign and got red. And um, anyway, several people got pissed off and we ended up having to take the project down, but you know, <laughs> every year, every year you basically can have some really funny um, or weird or like crazy stuff happen to you out there. So that DEF CON is, is really a great place to hang out with friends, um, meet new people, Sure. Um, like just experiment with, uh, with crazy stuff and, and, and have a good time. That brings up two points. The first point is people don't realize that their mobile device, whether it's a cell phone or a tablet is as big of a, a, uh, a threat to their corporate data. It's a bigger, it's a bigger threat. It's a bigger threat to their life. Yeah. True. True. Second thing is I forgot because that beer is kicking in. So <laughs> I'm going to pass the ball back over to Al. Oh, so the first thing on the cell phone, <laughs> you, yeah, if you don't think your cell phone is valuable, think about the fact that you do your banking on your cell phone. Think about that uh -huh. you may pay your house mortgage on your cell phone. Maybe you don't. Maybe you do that all through email. Well, guess what's on your phone, your email. So 100%. Um, what about your one-time password um, authentication? Is that on your cell phone as well? So, yeah, um, your cell phone is doing a lot of stuff and has access to a lot of stuff like your wireless networks that's in your house, along with the password to that and some other things. Um, yeah. Actually, that brings up my second point. Now that I remember, <laughs> when you're at when you're at Black Hat or DEF CON or B-Sides or any of these conferences, always, always put your laptop and your phone in a Faraday bag. <laughs> That way, yeah. it's inert, and they can't steal your stuff. Exactly. Right? Because everybody is. I see more and more scenarios where companies are denying bug bounty, right? So if folks have exposed something, they're actually turning on the hackers, trying to take them to court now for, for breaching versus participating in a bug bounty program. And I think yeah, and that's, that's, that's just going to... That's yeah, and that's just going to send that's going to send those exploit writers, those bug uh, bounty people uh, overseas to countries that are going to pay for it underground 
and going to be a bigger threat to that company and to every um, customer of that company. So they need to think about that um, before they turn off their bug bounty because bug bounties have become a, a super cheap way to check program application developers. Yeah, super I agree. Cheap. Jensen, Jensen Impact definitely needs to add multi-factor authentication to prevent anybody from taking over a gamer's account again. <laughs> Yeah, and and for you, you private developers in in the Steam environment, stop embedding crypto miners in your code. <laughs> oh my God, that's a great idea. It's been, yeah, why not think of that? It's it's already being done. Stop it, people. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate being on here. And uh, Chris, great to meet you, Jeremy. Pleasure. Awesome to meet you as well. We'll bring, we'll bring Al's Tesla, and we can practice hacking it. There you, there you go. go.